Go Inside the Crimson Tide with your hosts, Rodney Orr and Gary Harris, keeping you informed on everything Alabama. And now, Tider Insider TV. It was really cool. I mean, that stadium, was, it's massive. And, uh, you know, their fans, uh, you know, very, they're really cool for them. You know, they're uh, supporting them the whole game. We're loud. I know we had trouble, uh, you know, in the end of the second quarter with just how loud they were, but, uh, you know, it was, it was a really cool experience. Alabama wide receiver Richard Mullaney. A fifth-year senior, but new to the Southeastern Conference and new to that wild atmosphere at Texas A&M, well over 100,000 people at Kyle Field, newly renovated Kyle Field. Mulaney saying today that that was crazy, and he's just now learning how big Alabama, Tennessee is. We're going to help educate him tonight. Good evening, everybody, and welcome in to Tider Insider TV, presented each and every week by Buffalo Rock, alongside Rodney Orr from TiderInsider.com. I'm Gary Harris, WBUA 23 Sports Director. Tonight, Pepsi Max. You know... Rodney, love that sound. Zero calories, great Pepsi taste. And you know when I break out Pepsi Max, it's because I need a little extra oomph. And it's Tennessee week. And Alabama may have won eight in a row, as you well yeah. know. But you can never take a rivalry for granted. And we are going to get into that game big time in just a little bit. But let's start by reviewing what happened this past Saturday at Kyle Field and College Station. Alabama and Texas A&M. And uh, Rodney, we knew that this was going to be a tough football game. We said last week the key for Alabama could be to not let A&M get off to a fast start, survive that first quarter. Instead, the Tide got off to the quick start, 14 to nothing in the first, 28 to six in the second. Kind of let it get away from them for a while. It got to 28-20 in the third. Special teams miscues really hurt Alabama, but they were clearly the better football team, and they go on to win it 41-23. Well, we said two of the keys was, first of all, Kyle Allen, the quarterback for Texas A&M, in the first quarter of the previous four games had completed 82% of his passes. We thought Alabama had to set the tone defensively, get to him early, which they did. We also thought on the other side of the ball, Alabama had to line up, establish the line of scrimmage, run the football, which they did. Derrick Henry, first 10 carries, 159 yards. I mean, what a start for Alabama. Yeah, and a really good game defensively. Not only did they dominate Texas A&M again, holding the Aggies to 32 net rushing yards. This is a team that ran it fairly well, but three defensive touchdowns, two by Minka Fitzpatrick, one by Eddie Jackson. I mean, it's one thing to stop the other team. But take, you know, take away those 21 points they scored on defense, and that would have been a down-to-the-wire game. Well, I mean, and Alabama made some mistakes that certainly kept Texas A&M in the game, too, and set them up for opportunities. But, you know, you talk about the Alabama defense, Gary. Can you imagine going into Kyle Field facing one of the top quarterbacks in the country, even though he didn't look like it on Saturday? He certainly is, Kyle Allen. They've got tremendous group of receivers going in there, holding Texas A&M to one offensive touchdown, 316 total yards, as you mentioned, 32 yards rushing. What a fabulous defensive effort, and the pressure they got up front defensively was very impressive. Yeah, we kind of alluded to it, but before we wrap up our review, the only reason this was even a game, A&M was ready to be taken out, but special teams a concern. Reggie Ragland gets the targeting call when it was 28-6. to That backed the ball up. It would have been nearly at midfield. Alabama has to punt. The great freshman wide receiver for the Aggies gets the punt return. Suddenly it's 28-13. Then a blocked punt in the third quarter. A fumbled punt return by Cyrus Jones. That's an area they need to shore up. Now the place kicker, Griffith, is playing better. And J.K. Scott is punting well, but special teams as a whole was a liability on Saturday. Yeah, sometimes that happens. You know, you have a lot of breakdowns in one game in a particular area. It just happened to be this Saturday, this past Saturday, that that's what happened with the special teams, Gary. But they've been pretty solid for the most part. The kicking's been kind of inconsistent, but it was there on Saturday. So, you know, hopefully as we move forward, they get the other things ironed out. Of course, Christian Kirk will return a lot of punts against Absolutely. a lot of people. He's dangerous, that's for sure. But Alabama gets the win, 41-23, and the Tide is now 3-1 and one in the SEC. And how about Jake Coker? Now, the guy's a quarterback, but not only can he take a hit, he can dish one out as well. And his teammates are having some fun dishing out some nicknames for Coker. Jen Chapman of TITV has more. So many questions surrounded Jake Coker at the beginning of the season. Now, it's so many nicknames. Oh, I, I love it. I love it. It shows how tough and he's a competitor. Me, I call him Baby Roethlisberger. That's just me, though. After Saturday's win on the road at Texas A&M, the first-year QB said he doesn't believe in sliding, and his teammates are liking it. Vanilla, Vanilla Vic, Cam Cracker, and that's, 
Uh, there's a couple more, but I can't remember the, you know, it's, it's, it's getting out of hand. So what does Coach Saban think about his QB's no slide attitude? Well, I'm just telling you, sometimes I wish he wouldn't take the hits. I, but I kind of like to see the other team's reaction when he does that. He's firing up the Crimson Tide sidelines, so don't expect his hard-hitting ways to change. I mean, it's the personality of a player. All right, Jake is a tough, competitive guy. He's a big, physical guy. He's getting better and better every week. All right, so I don't want to take his aggressiveness away because we're fearful that something bad's going to happen. And I I'm just don't coach that way. Uh, I know the guys in the locker room are very proud of uh, Jacob and the job he's done. And each week you can tell he's improving in practice and when the games come. As for Jake, he's got one thing on his mind when he takes a big hit. I'm just thinking, get the first down, get whatever you can, and, and whatever happens, happens. So if it does anything to help us win, that's what I'm going to try to do. Bring on the nicknames. Rocky Top is next. Jen Chapman for Tighter Insider. And Rod, let's add to that. He, he may not be the prettiest quarterback all the time, but I tell you something, that toughness, it's contagious. You can tell his teammates love him. I think the fans are really starting to, to learn to love him. And this is becoming his team. And remember, this isn't meant to, you know, as a shot at anybody else, but the one game Alabama lost this season, he didn't start. He's really becoming a leader of this football team. Yeah, and I, I think the things that he's done, Gary, in terms of tucking the ball, running, showing the willingness to take a hit, I think that's certainly impressed his teammates and uh, helps him develop the leadership he needs. It reminds me a lot running the football with Tyler Watts. Yeah, they do look a lot like each other when they're running the ball. And both got a lot of yards and both wear the same number too. How about that? Yeah. All right, still to come on Tider Insider Television, we will hear from Tennessee head coach Butch Jones and Alabama head man Nick Saban as we look ahead to what used to be the third Saturday in October. This year again it's the fourth, but hey, it's still Alabama and Tennessee and it means a lot. We're back after this with your phone calls and emails as well. So go ahead and give us a ring now at 205-348-WVUA, 348-9882. Email us at TITV at WVUA23.com, or you can reach us on Twitter using the hashtag TITV. We're back with more right after this. Remember last year, Lane Kiffin did not get a warm return when he went back to Neyland Stadium. In fact, he was booed when he came out on the field. And then after the game, when returning to the locker room, he almost was hit by a bottle. He won't have to deal with any of that this year. The game will be in the friendly, friendly confines of Bryant-Denny Stadium. Now, horrific plays of the game. All right, the horrific play of the game turned out to be a game-changing play for Alabama. So good play for Alabama, but certainly horrific for the 100-plus thousand at Kyle Field when Eddie Jackson returned this Interception for a touchdown, 95 yards. That made it 28 to 6. And AM, even though they fought valiantly, could not get out of it their own way. And that is our Atrox Factory horrific play of the game. Mika Fitzpatrick also had a couple of interception returns for touchdowns. So the whole Alabama defensive secondary was horrific toward Texas AM on Saturday. And now it's time for our Coach Speak segment, brought to you each and every week by Med Center. Here's Nick Saban and Butch Jones at their respective press conferences on Monday. Well, I think this game coming up, you know, the Tennessee game is a special game to a lot of people, uh, you know, in the state of Alabama because the tradition and the rivalry uh, that exists here for a long, long time and the history that the game brings. Um, so it's most certainly a special game to, to us and our team to try to get ready to, you know, play a very good game against a very good Tennessee team. You know, Butch Jones has done a really good job. They've gotten better and better and better every year and could arguably be, be you know, undefeated or a one-loss team, you know, very easily this year. When you look at a defense, a lot of times they may be number one in, in one end of the, the categories in terms of, of running. The football, but then on pass, it's it's another element uh, with them. Very very balanced defense. Again, uh, very very disruptive uh, offensively. Just about 200 yards rushing per game. Uh, they've only given up eight sacks, and uh, we all know about Derrick Henry. He's a great back, uh, but uh, they have playmakers. I think they have individuals on their football team from the tight end position. Uh, to the wide receiver position that probably don't get as much credit as they deserve. Well, Rodney, let's break it down. Alabama is a 14-point favorite 
of course, as I like to say, it doesn't mean they start the game 14 to nothing. Alabama, you got to go out and earn it. And, and this is a big game, regardless of the fact that Alabama's won eight in a row, regardless of the fact that Tennessee is three and three. They're better than their record. And offensively, with the Vols, it all starts with Joshua Dobbs at quarterback. And this is a guy that Alabama knows well. Remember, they saw him a lot two years ago yeah. here in Tuscaloosa when they pulled the red shirt off of him. Tennessee did, and um, you know. This is a, a player that last year came in early and almost led Tennessee to a come-from-behind victory after Alabama got out to a big lead. Yeah, well, I think Alabama obviously had prepared for Worley, the other quarterback, and then he got hurt early on in the game. They brought Peterman in. He didn't last long. He was a lot like Worley, didn't have much mobility, and they brought Dobbs in, who is very mobile. You're talking about a true, true dual-threat guy. Two weeks ago against Georgia, he was a National Offensive Player of the, the Week when he produced 300 yards passing, over 100 yards rushing. You know, Gary, there's only been three quarterbacks in the last 20 years in the SEC that have done that. Tim Tebow, Johnny Manziel, Josh Dobbs. Dobbs is uh, finding his way. Great game against Georgia. He's that dual threat quarterback, but they've also got a couple of fine running backs. Jalen Hurd, a lot like Derrick Henry, big and strong. And former Alabama running back Alvin Kamara is kind of their change of pace guy, a little bit like Kenyon Drake. That's a pretty dynamic duo at running back, too. Yeah, it is. And, and uh, you know, when you talk about Hurd, you talk about his size. He really doesn't look like he weighs 240. He's almost 6'4". Uh, really big guy. He's got about 574 yards. He's averaging about four and a half yards a carry. So he's their most productive guy. Kamara, like you mentioned, he's kind of the guy that gives them that different look. He can catch the football out of the backfield. Very effective that way. You know, Gary, the first time Kamara touched the ball on a punt this year, he took it back 50 yards for sure a touchdown, did. and he's not even their punt return guy. And defensively, obviously, they miss Kurt Majet. He's their best player out with an injury. But uh, they've got some athletes on that side of the ball. Statistically, they're not great, but they are capable of disrupting, and, uh, you know, they're a pretty athletic unit. Yeah, you know, they give up 170 yards a game rushing. Right. So I think Alabama, from that perspective, I think Alabama can line up and run the football on Tennessee. I think they're vulnerable in the secondary to an extent. They give up 419 yards a game, you know, defensively. Uh, Jalen Reeves Maven, really an outstanding player at, for them at their weak linebacker spot, averages 10 tackles a game. So they've got a lot of talent here. This is a Tennessee team that has a lot of young mm -hmm. talent. I think when you look at them down the road in years to come, they're a team that's going to be a force in the SEC East. And real quickly, Rodney, you see the record at 3-3. Three and three, But, again, this is not, you know, hyperbole. This is true. They could easily, like Coach Saban said, be 6-0. and oh. Well, I think, you know, they're trying – they're learning how to win. I think that's what Tennessee's kind of going through with all these young players. They blew some games, you know, late Oklahoma, Arkansas, those two games. They came back two weeks ago against Georgia down 24 to 3. So, I mean, that was a, a tremendous comeback, one of Tennessee's largest comeback wins ever. All right, still to come here on TEI TV. We gave you the numbers a little bit earlier, but there again is the information on the screen on how you can get in touch with us because when we come back, we're going to take phone calls, answer emails. We'll hear from you. We'll be right back with the only show that takes you inside the Crimson Tide. Tider Insider TV will return after this timeout. A former Alabama running back found more trouble at his third collegiate home. Alti Tenpenny was arrested Sunday in Louisiana for possession of a firearm and discharging a weapon. Nickel State released a statement to the local newspaper saying Tenpenny was suspended. It's uh, his third suspension in less than a year. He was dismissed from UNLV's team in August after transferring from Alabama in January. He then landed at Nickel State. Now he has more issues there. I'd love to see that young man get things straightened out. All right, let's get right to the phone lines. They're lined up for us, Rodney. Plato and Panorama is with us. What's on your mind, Plato? Hey, good evening. Do you believe uh, this year with our youth in the offensive line, we have uh, simplified our blocking scheme as opposed to let's say, the 2012 line. Have y'all seen a difference there? Well, to be honest with you, Plateau, uh, I really don't know that they've done anything necessarily in terms of simplifying it this year versus what they did last year. So, you know, it'd be really difficult for me to answer that question. But they're trying to do what works, and I thought it was pretty effective against Texas A&M, particularly in that first half. Thank you, Plateau. Let's go over to Birmingham and talk to Latrell. Latrell, what's on your mind tonight? Yes, I have a question. Uh, do you all think or have any information if, if, if the running back uh, Scarborough is going to play any this you know, year? Latrell, we, you know, he played two carries late in the game against Georgia. I thought we might see him this past week. Uh, you know, Kenyon Drake got a little dinged in that game, but he is practicing. You know, it's hard for me to answer that question now. I, you know, I, I think we're going to see him some, but uh, 
I don't know for sure. I have no inside yeah. information. It's it's always when you, when you kind of look at how Nick Saban handles players, he brings them along slowly. Mm -hmm. I think when you're talking about a guy coming off a major injury, he doesn't have much experience. You're playing in really crucial games. You know, do you really want to put him in a spot where, you know, maybe he's really not ready for it? I think that maybe we might see him in this game if, if, if the game were to get into a situation where it was more comfortable mm -hmm. to put him in. And then after the break, Gary, with the, with the off week, I think certainly, you know, give him a little bit more work and then maybe possibly down the road you could see him because Alabama really needs another back. Now, listen, I understand Kenyon Drake's been banged up. He hasn't probably been playing as well as he some expected or he had in the past. But, you know, they've got to get a second guy, you know, some consistent reps, opportunities in the game because I, I thought personally that Derek kind of got a little bit tired as the game went along later. I think the heat might have had a factor and been a factor in that as well. All right, thank you, Latrell. Let's go to Millport and talk to Robert. Robert, how are you? Doing good. How are you guys doing this afternoon? Very well, sir. Lo love your show. Thank and you. Just uh, wanted to say we rock your top coming to town. We better keep our eyes open, guns loaded. Yes, one sir. comment I wanted to make, uh, I'm not one to beat down on the officials, but uh, what do you guys think about the calling in the A&M game? I, I thought uh, they kind of favored A&M. There's a couple of blocks in the back. Hit, late hits outside. Uh, just wanted to get y'all's comments. Yeah, Robert, and I off the phone. Listen. Good point. And I'm I'm not one to beat up on officials either, but I'm with you. I I didn't think the officiating was very good in that game. A and M one penalty for five yards, despite the fact that they pretty much got dominated in the game. Uh, Tony Brown got blocked in the back. They picked up the flag. Um, Marlon Humphrey made a play on the sideline. Look, it could have been an interception. They didn't review it yet. They reviewed Eddie Jackson's touchdown. Uh, I didn't think it was the SEC officiating crew that worked that game's best best game. Let me yeah. just say that. Well, I I really wondered about the right tackle for Texas A&M. He jumped the count early probably 10 or 12 times. They didn't call it, but it was clear that he was jumping early. All right. That is going to do it for this segment, but when we come back, we are going to have more phone calls and emails, so we'll hear from more of you. There's the information there on your screen, so stick around. More TITV is on the way right after this. We continue now with phone calls and emails here on TITV. It's Tennessee week for the Crimson Tide. Not the third Saturday this year, the fourth instead, but it's still Alabama and Tennessee. We got an email Rodney we want to get to, and it's about uh, Mika Fitzpatrick, who is a fantastic player. Juanel wants to know, CBS commentators refer to Mika Fitzpatrick as Alabama's Honey Badger. I would suggest Mika the Playmaker Fitzpatrick. Well, he's certainly bigger than the Honey Badger, but he is a Playmaker, Juanel. There's no doubt about it. I said on my radio show, Rodney, that for me, he's a defensive version of Julio Jones, meaning he was ready to play the minute he got on campus. Yep. Well, I think when you look at him, he does a lot of the same things that uh, Honey Badger did at LSU. I think, uh, you know, the, the ability to rush the passer, he made a big play in, in sacks. He's had a couple of sacks this year. He's made plays in the kicking game like the Honey Badger did. He's, he's picked off passes, returned them for touchdowns. So I understand the comparison. Oh, yeah, he's a lot obviously like that as player. He, he's just bigger. Yeah, obviously he is bigger, but uh, has the same kind of colored tips, too. Huh? Yeah, he is a player, though. He and Eddie Jackson right now are just tearing it up in that secondary. All right, let's go back to the phone lines, stay here in Tuscaloosa and talk to Leroy. Hey, Leroy, what's up? Uh, yes, I want to know uh, the, the health of Cam Sims and why he's not in the rotation if he's healthy. All right, Leroy, well, they're trying to work him in more. He is coming off a major knee surgery. Uh, I think they might have been surprised that he got back as quick as he, he did. He's we're still wearing a big knee brace, so they're playing him some, but um, – you know, you got to be careful with those guys, especially receivers. Yeah, that was braces. a significant knee injury, and I, I really didn't know, you know, how soon he would be back. He, he certainly did a great job rehabbing, getting back sooner than maybe some people expected. But, again, Gary, I, I really don't know if anything further has happened. That's certainly not been out there. All right, thanks for the phone call, Leroy, but he's going to be a good football player for Alabama. Let's stay here in T-Town and talk to CB. Hey, CB, what's going hey, on, man, my man? I know y'all wide open. Uh, O-line, D-line, all that played better. Who does the counting of the players on the field? That's been going on forever. That just drives me up the wall. The team looked better. Better them re re run when they intercept and run it back. Looked great. Now the county of the players come up for officials. Or are you talking about for the sideline? Not from the sideline, it's on the field. We ain't got enough or too many. A lot. Well, of time. yeah, they they've got coaches that are that are in charge of that. It you know when you run that many guys on and off, sometimes it happens all over the country. Guys get caught sometimes, but Alabama does a pretty good job of getting them yeah, in and this out. This isn't like the seventies. I mean, they're 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 specialized. They're sending personnel on and off yeah. the field, CB, and I, I think sometimes that just happens. Really, it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the phone calls tonight and the emails. Some good ones. Good to hear from you. You're a big part of the program. When we come back, it's. Prediction time for the Tide and the Vols. 
Rodney and I will tell you who we think will win and why right after this on TITV. It is a beautiful evening in Tuscaloosa. Stay with us. Once again tonight, Rodney and I are outfitted in original elephant wear from the locker room located on University Boulevard in Tuscaloosa on the Strip. It's the home of the original elephant wear, a Tuscaloosa tradition since 1964. Go by and see Alex Gatewood and his courtesy, courteous staff, or you can shop online. You don't even have to go to the store, but if you're in town, do go by and see them. They've got ladies wear as well. It's a great, great place, and, you know, I just love going in there because you get treated so well, and you get to look good, too. All right, Roddy, it's time now for our picks, and uh, we'll start with you as we always do. Yeah, you know, when I look at this game, it reminds me so much of 2009 when Tennessee came in here as an improving team, and they had a week off, and Alabama was a gas football team after playing several games in a row, and... You know, Tennessee almost won that football game. I think Alabama certainly needs to be on guard with that. You certainly don't want a mental letdown. I think it's all, it's all about the mindset for Alabama in this one. I think they win 30-17. to 17. Rodney, you know, I, I do believe in the Alabama talent. I, I think it's there to win a national championship. This team has not been the most consistent. It's been mistake prone. And at home in particular, I cannot figure out why they've played so much better on the road than they've played at Bryant-Denny Stadium. I, I like Tennessee. I, I like what you said earlier, Rodney. They're a young, talented team, but they're not ready. And I think Alabama's tired of listening to the chatter that they don't play well at home. They lost Ole Miss. They struggled against Arkansas. I think they get it right. It's a blowout, in my opinion, Rod. I wow. just think Tennessee's not ready. I like Bama big. If we'll punch it up on the screen, I'll tell you how big. 35-13. How about that? I like the tie to roll on Saturday afternoon in Tuscaloosa. All right, it's dinner time, and tonight we're headed to see our good friend Philip Guy and the staff at Buddy's Ribbon Steak. We'll be over there at about 7.15. Come by and join us for dinner. Mm-mm, it's good, and I'm hungry. That's going to do it for the show. For Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. We'll replay tonight at 10.30, or you can catch it anytime on WVUA23.com. Good night.